Our subject this morning, Almost Home, and it seems like that's a more appropriate title by the minute these days because the world is collapsing. It's literally collapsing. I believe that we are watching now the collapse of Western civilization. I don't know how much further we can go down this road before Jesus just finally comes because it is a mess out there. And this morning, we're going to have a bit of a Bible study together that I think will help us wrap our minds, I pray and hope, it will help us wrap our minds around a lot of the foolishness and the madness that's going on in the Western world right now. It's hard to wrap your mind around what a state of disarray there is out there, but I'm hoping that our study will help us land a few airplanes planes and and sort of get a grasp of where we are in the course of history and in um, civilization in general. And I'm going to warn you, as we get started, it's going to seem a little bit like an eclectic collection of thoughts. It's like, Sean, you keep changing subjects every five minutes. Yeah, because what we're doing is we're going to make a string of popcorn. Remember those? You get some thread and you put some popcorn on that thread and, and it's like, okay, Sean, we just looked at that kernel. Why are you on to the next one? You'll see. I'm hoping and praying by the end that we'll be able to stand back and see the whole string of thoughts and that it should all fall into place for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, We know, because this book introduced us to Jesus and that it changed our lives, that this is not an ordinary volume. This is your voice. You've communicated through the prophets to reveal yourself to us. You have told us you are there. You have guided us through life through this book. And I'm asking again that we would be guided, but more than that, changed, so that we would be a little more Christ-like when we're done spending our time together this morning. Bless me. Take the butterflies away, Lord. I pray that what I speak would be honoring to you, that there be a smile on your face because I've been faithful. That's what we long for. We want to see Jesus. Lord, we really want to see him soon, face to face. But for right now, let us see him in the word. Let us hear you speak to us. And we covenant with you one more time that when you speak to our hearts, we will follow the lamb wherever he goes. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, everybody, is it warm in here? I mean, what are you doing with your heat wave in Portland, Oregon? It's 85 degrees today. How many would be deeply offended if I lost my jacket? Not one. It's gone. And my boots are gone. And I promise this is as far as we go. It's a little-known secret that I practice my sermons in shorts. I'm shorts and t-shirt, no socks even. It's like, I'll get as close to the line as I can so that I am comfortable. Everybody has got their favorite passages of the Bible. You know the ones I'm talking about, the ones that you go to again and again and again, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. You love to read them because they resonate with you. They kind of ring your bell. You agree with them. And, uh, and that's a good thing, because everybody should be so familiar with their Bible that they know passages by heart, and they do keep going back to them. But you do know what happens if you never expand your Bible reading past your favorites. You know, you've got to do that once in a while and go to the passages that don't resonate with you and make you squirm a little bit so that you are sure you're still sitting under God's instruction instead of just highlighting your own theological hobby horses and assumptions. And we're all prone to that. The danger of sticking to just your favorite passages in this book is that you're going to stop growing in time. You're going to become that 60-year-old hoping he can still get into his high school clothes, and you know they're not going to fit anymore. You're supposed to grow past that. Unfortunately, we do have this habit where we just stick to our favorites. I do it all the time. In fact, I'm going to do it this morning. I'm going to go to some of my all-time favorites, and some of you are going to say, Sean, you go to those same passages over and over and over and over again. Yes, I do. But, again, it's important that you always go past what makes you comfortable and read the entire book. You can hear evidence in Sabbath school sometimes that we love to stick to our favorite passages and don't spend a lot of time expanding our biblical knowledge. You go and sit in the average Sabbath school class here in the North American Division and listen to the conversation. It will not matter what the topic in the quarterly is. It doesn't matter at all. You will hear the same talking points coming from everybody week after week, month after month, year after year, 
over and over and over again. In fact, I'll bet that you could get on an airplane, leave your home church for 10 years, go to the other side of the planet, have no contact with that church whatsoever, come back in 10 years, sit in that same Sabbath school class, and everybody will be roughly sitting in the same seats they were a decade ago, unless they passed away in the intervening time. They'll be in the same seats, and they'll bring up the same talking points. And there's nothing wrong with those talking points. They're all true, and they're valuable. I'll give you some examples. The ones I've been hearing for 30 years all around the planet. Somebody will raise up their hand and say, did you know that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care? Is that true? Yes, it is. It's one of the most valuable evangelistic principles. 95% of soul winning is in a loving personal relationship. Only 5% of it is the conveyance of information or the sermons from the front. It's 95% relationship. So that statement is true and it's valuable. The problem is we love to repeat it over and over and over again and we never get out there and actually care for somebody who isn't one of us. We don't step out and try the principle. Here's another one. Did you know that the health message is the right hand of the gospel. That is absolutely true. I've heard it over and over, and it's true. Our movement has been blessed with the most incredible information to reveal to the world that God cares about you, not just in the hereafter, but right now too. He cares about how you're doing. The problem is, is we love to recite that phrase, but we never seem to get out there and take people past the right arm into the gospel and introduce them to Jesus and invite them home into God's church. Here's another one. Pastor, we had a booth at the county fair just two weeks ago. We handed out all kinds of literature, and you never know what seeds were sown. That one drives me crazy a little bit as an evangelist because it is true. It is true that you don't really know what seeds were sown until the day you step into the kingdom of God and see what God has done through our meager efforts. But it's not true that you never know what seeds were sown. We could know what seeds were sown if we did the work that God counseled us to do and followed up with people and did it in an organized fashion. One more. One more example. I've heard it a thousand times, and it's true. I love it. We need to use Christ's methods. Ministry of Healing, page 143. Everybody knows this one, right? You've heard it in Sabbath school again and again and again. We use Christ's methods alone. You meet the needs of the people and then bid them, come follow me. That's valuable. I've used it for 30 years, and I'll tell you it's the truth, and it works. The problem is we do a lot of making friends and being friendly, but we never seem to land on the come follow me part. We don't invite them into fellowship in the church. And here's the point that I'm driving at to start this morning. Talking alone does not move the needle for the kingdom of God. We are not going to talk our way into Jesus coming. God is not waiting for us to have the right opinion. That's not what he's waiting on. He's waiting on us to finish the work. And if you and I were actually living the mission of the church, instead of just talking about it, and I do more talking than I should, I always do ask my wife, I'm the talkative half of our marriage, but if we were actually doing what we were told and living the mission of the church, we would have something new to say every week. We'd have a new story, a new example of how God used that principle through our meager effort somewhere in the community. We should be able to come up with new examples from recent history all the time if we're doing what God told us to do. And our churches should be growing. And if our churches are growing because we've been doing what it is that God asked us to do, that would mean that we personally are also growing in Christ. At least that's what it says in one of my favorite passages that I go back to over and over and over. Some of you already know what's about to show up on the screen because I think I pull it out every single year. Steps to Christ, page 80. It's one of my favorites. We are told if you will go to work as Christ designs that his disciples shall and win souls for him, you will feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge in divine things and will hunger and thirst after righteousness. She's telling us that evangelism, outreach, winning people to Christ grows us. How? You will plead with God, and your faith will be strengthened, and your soul will drink deeper drafts at the well of salvation. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to the Bible and prayer. And in that context, now when you open your Bible, it makes even more sense to you because we're finally reading this book the way that God intended us to read it. This is not just a book full of facts that we're supposed to learn and memorize before Jesus comes. This is a manual for salvation, for your salvation and for the salvation 
of your neighbors. Now the book makes sense when you encounter the opposition and trials. I'll tell you, when you go out in the field and you start sharing Jesus with people, the devil knows how to punch back. And he punches back really hard. Now you've got no choice but to go to the scriptures and ask God, what next? Now what do we do? She continues, you will grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ and will develop a rich experience. Let me give you a diagnosis. Do you know why most churches die? Do you know why it is? Well, Sean, it's because, and, and I want to preface this a little bit. We often say, oh, the church is in such horrible shape, it's dying everywhere. That's not true, praise the Lord. It's not even close to true. The Seventh-day Adventist church is doing remarkably well all over the world, and not just all over the world, right here in North America. Other churches are starting to envy what's happening among us. We're the only church in North America that is actually growing. We're the only one at this moment. It's just this one. That's it. And other churches are saying, how does that happen? But every so often, a church gets shuttered. And we shake our heads and we say, that's not great. It died off. Do you know why churches die off? Well, Sean, it's because we didn't have enough youth programs. Maybe not. Maybe you didn't. Oh, Sean, it's because we didn't do enough community service. That may be true. Maybe you didn't do enough in the community to help people. But that's not why churches die. If churches die, it's for one reason and one reason only. They're not soul winning. End of discussion. End of the day. If we're not doing the one thing that God asked us to do as a church, our church begins to die. It's that simple. She continues. This is my favorite part. The only way. Notice I underlined that. Does it say one of the ways? No. The only way to grow in grace is to be disinterestedly doing the very work which Christ has enjoined upon us to engage to the extent of our ability in helping and blessing those who need the help that we can give them. It's really this simple. If you want a better experience with God, if you want a better experience in the Bible, if you want the meaning of this book to suddenly fall open and you want to see things you've never seen before, there's two simple steps. Number one, read the whole thing, not just your favorite parts. And then number two, go and do what it says. That's when you begin to understand it. You remember what happened to Jesus when the authorities are saying, man, we don't know if we can trust this guy. We don't know if what he's saying is the truth. And Jesus says this in John 17. Here's what he tells them. If anyone wills to do his will, not study more, notice what he says. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. You will not truly understand the truth of the Bible unless you're living it, unless you're actually doing God's will. And I can assure you, saints, this morning, it is not God's will that we get together once a week and try to fix everybody else's behavior. Amen? That is not what Jesus has raised this movement up to do. It is not even God's will. And this one... This one might come as a shock to some. It is not even God's will that we lock ourselves in a closet somewhere in isolation from the rest of the world and study the Bible more. You should be studying the Bible more, but you will never understand it unless you do it. It is God's will for you to get involved in the work of the kingdom. Look, you can spend... Day after day after day after day in quiet contemplation. And if I could have what I wanted, that would be it. I would lock myself in an office till Jesus comes and I would study and study and study. You can read all the Bible commentaries you want, and, and you should. Over 2,000 years, God has raised up some incredibly faithful people who read this book and had a lot to say about it. You should read that stuff, but that isn't how we grow in the end. If you really want to understand the Word of God, you got to do it. you got to do what God asked us to do. There's the most important Bible commentary in existence is the commentary of your neighborhood. That is the most profound Bible commentary in the world because if you get out there and talk to those people and listen to what concerns them and listen to what keeps them awake at night and they ask you, what do you know? You're going to go back to this book and you're going to search for answers and grow in your walk with Christ. The only way to truly understand the scriptures is to do what Jesus was doing. And my Bible says he came in to seek and to save that which was lost. You have to live the book if you want to know the book. In fact, people come to me with advice quite often. And some of it is really good. I appreciate good advice. 
but not all the advice that comes is good. I will get people who approach me and say, Pastor, this is how you should do the work of evangelism and soul winning. It should be like this. We've been thinking about it and studying it, and you need to do the following. Now, it might be good advice, it might not be, and I have one question to diagnose whether or not I want to listen to this, and that question is this. It's simple. Please, you might be right. Tell me how this worked in your last soul-winning effort. Did this work? Is your church growing by using this principle? And if the answer indicates that they have never done it, I disregard the advice a thousand percent. Because if you are not doing the work that God has called us to do, and there's only one thing, Testimonies, Volume 9, page 19. The only thing that is to absorb our attention is the preaching of the three angels' messages, bringing people to Christ. That's the only thing we're supposed to be doing. And if you're not actually doing it, then your perspective on the Scriptures becomes tainted with selfishness. Your Bible study becomes about you. I remember actually sitting in a college classroom one time, and if you're a professor, you never wanted me in your college class. I was that kid you wished would drop out because of the stuff that I would ask. And I was sitting in a classroom one time, and I was listening to a professor. It, it doesn't matter where. I won't tell where. But he was going on and on and on about church growth and mission and evangelism, and I was listening to him, and a lot of what he said didn't sit right with me. And I couldn't put my finger on what it was that didn't sit right with me. And then at one point, he started to quote from authors that I knew full well, PhDs, I knew full well did not believe in the inspiration or the infallibility of the Word of God. They didn't believe in it. And I thought, aha, this is all just theory. That's all it is. And I intended, I promise you, saints, I intended to keep my mouth shut because I don't always want to be the smart aleck. I don't. I often am, but I don't always want to be the smart aleck. But I couldn't take it after a few minutes because I'm watching the other students write every down and I'm thinking they're on their way to their first churches soon and they're going to implement these horrible ideas and it's going to cause real harm in the church. I can't keep quiet. But I also don't believe in picking fights. I don't believe in debating. I, I don't. You notice Jesus doesn't even debate the devil in the book of Jude. So debating usually goes nowhere. I mean, how often in your life have you seen people debating on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and somebody finishes off by saying, you know what, you're completely right and I was completely wrong. Fighting is usually a waste of time, but I couldn't take it anymore. I saw new students writing their heads, nodding their heads, writing stuff down. They were nodding in agreement, and I thought, I can't just let this slide, but I don't want to pick a fight. What do I do? I know that what the professor is saying is veggie baloney. I know that for a fact because I have been working at this point as an itinerant evangelist. Just three or four years. I wasn't very experienced, but I knew it wasn't true. So I finally raised my hand and I said, Sir, just one question, maybe to help me understand what you're teaching. Could you give me one example of how this actually worked in your church and it really made a difference in the cause of God? And he fell silent. Because even though he'd been assigned to teach the class, he'd never actually done it. Now, some people are going to say, man, Sean, you're being a little bit unreasonable. You should be more open to advice. You could afford to be a little more humble. That's true. I could afford to be a little more humble, a lot more humble. Ask Jean those questions. She'll tell you I could afford to be a lot more humble. But I'll tell you what else is true. It's not that I reject all advice. If your name is Ron Halverson and you call me, rest in peace, Ron, I miss you. If you call me, I'm all ears. If your name is Dan Bensinger, if your name is HMS Richards, I'm all ears because I know for a fact at that point there is dirt under your fingernails, there is bloody sweat on your forehead, and you have spent your life on the battlefield fighting for Christ. Now I'm all ears. But those occasional letters that arrive on my desk once in a while, the ones written by people who were trying to bend the whole universe in their own direction all the time, and make everything in the church suit their needs and their tastes. I have a special round file for those letters. I don't even finish reading them anymore. And I don't have to, Sean, you should finish reading. No, we don't have time anymore, folks. We don't have time to sit around and debate useless things anymore or address our own needs. Jesus is coming and it's time to get back to work. We are running out of time and the debating and the bickering and all that stuff has got to come to an end because sinners are going to Christless graves without us. Going to Christless graves. And here's what you'll discover if you do. Exercise the height of courage and try. You're going to find out God's still at work. You know, he hasn't abandoned the planet. 
He's just as close. Ellen White puts it this way. Heaven is no further away today than it was 2,000 years ago. But people will still say, Sean, but where are the miracles? I read the Gospels and I read the book of Acts and I'm wondering, where are all the miracles? God doesn't do those anymore. Yes, he does. He just doesn't do them where you happen to be sitting. He's out on the front lines of your community changing hearts. He's moving the needle for the kingdom of Christ every single day and doing the impossible out there. God does not perform the miraculous to entertain the saints. He doesn't. If you want that, I've got churches all over the city I could send you to. They'll amuse you to death, and you'll lose your way with Christ in the process. God does not do the miraculous to entertain us. He does it to save lost sinners. And if you ever really, really, really want to see a genuine miracle, then be in the home at that moment when a hopeless sinner somehow, impossibly, breaks away from the devil and released from the chains of sin and accepts the forgiveness of God and walks into a new life. God's doing that every day, sometimes even when we're not there. He's busy right now. Now, all of that was a preface to my real subject, but you'll see why, I hope, by the time we end. It's time now to go to one of my all-time favorite passages of the Bible that I go to a thousand times over, and that would be the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. It's quite a favorite passage, but it's the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Why do I love these 11 chapters so much? It's because I've become convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that you can find everything that the remnant church teaches and believes in those first 11 chapters of Genesis. It is all there. It's foundational. Those first 11 chapters tell us about the nature of sin. They tell us about the need for sacrifice and the role of Messiah. They tell us about God's moral requirements. They give us the reasons for the Sabbath. You find the truth about the state of the dead in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. You find the promise of paradise restored in eternity with Christ in the first 11 chapters. You'll find the doctrine of the sanctuary in Genesis chapter 3 explained very clearly. You'll find the beginnings of the health message in Genesis chapter 2. In those first 11 chapters, you'll find the spirit of prophecy at work in real time in the real world and you finally find this explanation for the big problem of evil that the world wrestle with. How can God be good and the world is so evil? How? You find the answer in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. In fact, if I was ever committed of a crime, if I ever convicted of a crime, right? The judge is saying, Sean, you're going away for life. It would be on speeding tickets. It would have to be a lot of speeding tickets to get me away for life, I guess, but... Or it's the time of trouble. Let's make it the time of trouble, and I'm going away for preaching the gospel. And they're going to put me in prison for the rest of my days. Right? I'm going to be gone forever. And the judge takes pity on me at sentencing. He says, I know you love to read. And in the library, in the, there's a library in the prison, but we're cutting you off. You're not allowed to read anything anymore as long as you live. You're going to sit in your cell. But because I kind of like you, and I'm taking a little pity, I'm going to let you take 10 sheets of paper into the prison. That's it. 10 sheets of paper. I know what I would pick. I would take the first 10 sheets out of my Bible. I would pick Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I'd take those pages. I'm hoping that they're on 10. It should be. And I would pick those. Now, I want everything else. Don't get me wrong. I want the Gospels. I want the book of Acts. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I want Daniel and Revelation for sure. I want that in my prison cell. But if I had to pick, first 11 chapters of Genesis. Because they provide you with this powerful reminder of everything you've ever learned about Jesus. It's all in there. And if I have to pick and choose, I'm taking those sheets. Not only that, because those first 10, 11 chapters of Genesis deal with the biggest questions human beings have ever struggled with, they make pretty good witnessing material on top of it all. I could share those 11 pages with my bunkmate, my cellmate, and ask him what he thinks about it. They're good things. I've noticed that you can cover everything we believe out of those first 11 chapters. Now, there's something else I've noticed about those first 11 chapters, particularly right after I became a Christian, 30-some years ago now. When you go to other cultures and you read the stories from those ancient cultures like the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Egyptians or my Germanic barbarian ancestors who probably ate some of your ancestors and worshiped trees out in the woods, my ancestors, when you read their stories, their origin stories and their mythology, here's what you get. You get a bunch of itty-bitty gods that were made in our image, not the other way around. You don't get human beings made in the image of God. You get gods made in the image of man. These pagan gods are petty. They're jealous. 
They fight with each other. They have affairs. They eat their own children like Kronos did. I mean, these stories are abysmal. These pagan gods treat the human race like an ant pile. We're bored. Let's go out and kick the human ant pile over and see what kind of fun we can. They're horrible gods. They are nothing like the God of Genesis. Nothing at all. That's why I'm so adamant so often that the book of Genesis is not just one more example of mythology. It stands in stark contrast to all the mythology of the ancient world. What I find fascinating is how many ancient pagans started to realize that at one point. In fact, at one point there was a guy by the name of Xenophanes. He lived about 500 years before Christ. Xenophanes, about the time shortly after we go back to Jerusalem, shortly after Ezra, He's thinking things through, and Xenophanes comes to a startling conclusion. We don't have a lot of what he wrote. We mostly have statements that other thinkers wrote down that he made. But at one point, 500 years before Christ, Xenophanes wrote this. God is one. Supreme among gods and men and not like mortals in body or mind. What's going on with this guy? He's getting embarrassed by Greek mythology. He said, you guys, this is embarrassing. Enough is enough. We've got to have a God who's actually morally better than we are. Our gods are awful beings. If we want to find real wisdom, if we want to understand the nature of the universe, we've got to get rid of all of our stupid petty gods and go find the creator God, the one true God. I call Xenophanes... The Greek Abraham, he's a convert to the one true God standing in a pagan culture, pushing back the most powerful influences of his day. And he gets to this conclusion by using his noodle. He thinks things through, and he's thinking, pagan gods are too small to explain the universe. There's got to be a... He's a great example of what Paul describes in Romans chapter 1, how you can find God by studying the creation. Natural science done right will lead you right to the feet of the Creator. So I call him the Greek Abraham. And I say that because of an ancient legend that you will not find in the pages of the Bible. So you're going to want to take what I'm about to say with a massive grain of salt because it does not come from the Bible. It comes from the writings of Josephus. This is a story that the Jews handed down for thousands of years, orally, one generation to the next. And finally, Josephus said, you know, that's important enough to write down. And it's become intriguing to me because I suspect there's an element of truth in it. It's not scripture, but I think there might be something in it. That story says that at one point, Abraham was living in Babel when he was young. Abraham was living under Nimrod the king. And we know that Nimrod built the city of Babel. Genesis 10 is very clear about that. And so he's the king of Babel. In the story that Josephus tells, this ancient tale, somebody comes to Nimrod as he's busy telling everybody to build the Tower of Babel. And they say to Nimrod, there's a baby who's coming who's going to destroy you. It's a prophecy. So Nimrod panics. He's a little bit like Herod or Pharaoh, and he wants to kill off all the firstborn boys now because he can't let this prophecy come to pass. So he builds a special hospital, the Nimrod Hospital in Babel. And if you're going to have a baby, you have to go to the Nimrod Hospital to have that baby. It's the only in-network hospital in the city of Babel for childbirth. And if you went there and had a baby girl... You're allowed to take her home, give her a name and raise her and love her and experience the joy of that child. If you had a baby boy, however, the soldiers would come and take that boy away from you and put it to death so that the prophecy never came to pass. I've seen enough ancient records to suspect from all over the ancient Middle East to suspect that that story is entirely true. In the legend now, here comes the legend part, and this is probably the reason that it didn't show up in the Bible. There's, a reason. There's always a reason it doesn't end up in the inspired writings. The Jews value the story, but they didn't include it in Scripture. Because in the story, Abraham's mom discovers she's expecting a child. So to avoid going to the Nimrod hospital, she leaves town and has the baby in a cave. Way out of town, hiding in a cave. Now here's the part that makes it clear this is just a legend. Abraham somehow, from newborn to middle-aged man, 10 weeks. He's suddenly a middle-aged man. 10 weeks later, he grows up in 10 weeks, and he returns to the city of Babel. And as he's walking around in the legend, he looks up at the sky, at the sun, moon, and stars, and thinks, those can't be gods. I know my dad worships them, but they can't possibly be gods. Here's the way Josephus actually records the story. At the age of 75, he, Abraham, left Chaldea. That's true. God having bidden him to remove to Canaan. 
That's biblical. And there he settled and left the country to his descendants. Also biblical. He was a man of ready intelligence on all matters. That's probably true. Persuasive with his hearers. I love that statement. He was probably a pretty good evangelist. He was leading people to Christ. And not mistaken in his inferences. Here it comes. Hence he began to have more lofty conceptions of virtue than the rest of mankind and determined to reform and change the ideas universally current concerning God. In other words, there's only one God. We know that's true of Abraham. He was thus the first boldly to declare, he's really restoring the truth, but in those days, he was the, thus the first boldly to declare that God, the creator of the universe, is one. This he inferred from the changes to which land and sea are subject, from the course and the sun and the moon and from all the celestial phenomena. Abraham, according to the legend, and it's just a legend, says, man, everything in this world changes. Everything moves. Everything changes. It's always in flux. There's got to be something behind it that is stable and immovable and universal. The pagan gods aren't big enough. That's kind of why I call Xenophanes a Greek Abraham, because he was smart enough to see that the Greek gods aren't big enough to, explore, to explain the universe either. The Greek gods were more like comic book characters. In fact, if you look at it, the superhero movies that are coming out now from Marvel and DC, it'll blow your mind if you pay attention how many of those characters are named after the old pagan gods. Wonder Woman is Diana. Thor, that one's easy. Thor and Loki and so on. They're comic book characters. Those aren't gods. They're not. And back in Xenophanes' day, he realized these aren't big enough to explain the universe. And you'll notice something else in ancient pagan myths that's different from the Bible. They felt the need to explain where their gods came from. They all had an origin story. Our god was born here, this god was born there, this one came into being like that. They were so much like human beings, these gods, that they had to have a birth story, or the story didn't seem complete. And then they tried to explain how these sort of inferior gods actually made the human race. And here's where it gets fascinating. The answer from the pagans was the pagan gods had to use pre-existent materials to make the human race. They're not actually creators, they're artists at best. They have to take what's already there and make the human race. So, for example, this book. This is one we discovered in the 1800s on tablets around the city of Nineveh. This is the Enuma Elish. This is the Babylonian creation story. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. In this book, you have two classes of gods. You've got the upper class that lay around all day and party like Belshazzar. They're up here having fun. And then you have a lower class of gods, according to the Babylonians, who are slaves. They're somehow forced to work on earth digging irrigation ditches, and they're getting sunburns, and they're getting tired. So this story gives us, really, the very first Marxist revolution. And I only say that sort of half-kiddingly, because this was discovered right around the time that Karl Marx started writing the Communist Manifesto. And I believe with all my heart he read this and implemented some of the ideas, because the second-class gods in this story, they mount a Bolshevik revolution. They start a revolution, it doesn't end well, everybody's dead in the end, and they finally have a solution for all the slave gods. We're going to create a human race, and they're the replacement slaves. That's where we come from, according to the Babylonians. We are slaves to the gods, and we dig the ditches, so the slaves have a day off. And the human race is made from the blood of the mother goddess, mixed with the clay, of the, made from pre-existent materials. Because pagan gods couldn't create anything. The Bible's very clear. The reason we only worship God is because he is the creator. When you get to the book of Genesis, suddenly it's completely different. At the very beginning of the story, there is no attempt to explain where God comes from. He's just there. He's always been there. God in the Bible has no beginning. There's no explanation where he comes from. That would have driven the pagans absolutely crazy because they're like three-year-old toddlers, the pagans. Why, mommy? Why, mommy? Where, mommy? How, mommy? They have to know where everything comes from. Genesis doesn't explain where God comes from. There are no pre-existent materials. There isn't a universe full of energy or particles. God just speaks, and it's suddenly all there. And from that point forward, the book of Genesis becomes really fascinating. I believe it is the best guide for understanding what human beings are that has ever been written. It deals with all the biggest questions that human beings have struggled with for thousands of years. If you want to put it in philosophical terms, Genesis is a great textbook for metaphysics. What's metaphysics? It's the study of what's out there. How did it all come to be? Philosophers struggle with this. In fact, Spinoza, the Jewish philosopher, medieval philosopher, said the biggest question in the world is why is there something there instead of nothing there? 
That doesn't sound like a complicated question until you spend an afternoon thinking about it. It's the most profound question in the universe. Why is there something here and where did it come from? Genesis deals with ethics and politics. It helps us understand morality and the question of how we're supposed to coexist with each other peacefully. And it deals with epistemology. What's epistemology? It's the study of how do we know what we know? I mean, how do you know that your information is accurate? How do you know that you know anything for... I know it's weird to God's people, but out there in the world, they struggle with this. How do I know I actually know anything? Genesis deals with all these questions. It's not lying on the surface. You're going to have to dig a little bit, but it's all in there, including one of the biggest questions that has ever been asked that I want to deal with in a little bit of detail today. What happened when we sinned? Why are we so broken? What happened to us? Now, there's no way in the moments that we have left that I can cover this question adequately. I'm going to frustrate you like, like crazy. You can spend the next week thinking about the questions we're about to raise. There's just a few things about this that I want you to think about because I think it will help us understand the madness going on out there right now. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world is falling apart, and it's not like it was even 10, 5, 10 years ago. It is changing faster, and your neighbors are terrified right now. And I'm convinced that what we are seeing happen all around us right now is just the final expression of something we did in the Garden of Eden way back when. Now, to get the study rolling, we're going to look at a New Testament story. And, and I decided to put this in here because we looked at it as a staff at VOP a few weeks ago. We have daily readings that we do as a staff. We work our way through the Bible, and I got assigned the story of Pontius Pilate. And I want to read that to you, and I want you to ask one question as we go through the story, and it's really simple. What is motivating all the characters in this story to make the decisions they do? So let's just read that in some detail now. It says in Luke 23, verse 1, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. Okay, that was a lie. And saying that he himself is Christ, a king. What's motivating the crowd to think this way? Just, just contemplate that. We know they're wrong, but how are they this wrong? How do you get to this point? Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man, but they were what? What is it? I know you're out there. I can see you. What is it? Urgent. Why are these people motivated by such a sense of urgency? What is motivating this angry crowd? When you're urgent, you're never thinking clearly. If it's always an emergency, you're never thinking clearly. He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Why? What's motivating that? And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in fine clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Here's an interesting thought for the final crisis that's about to break on this earth. Adversity makes for some very strange bedfellows. And you're going to be surprised in the years or months or weeks ahead at who forms an alliance. Some of them we know. America reaching across the Gulf. and so Some of them we know, but you're going to be shocked by the other alliances that suddenly come to the surface when the world decides that God's people are the problem in this world. Verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. That's logical truth. I will therefore punish and release him. Punish him for what? What's motivating Pilate to punish Jesus? But they all cried out together, Away with this man, release us to Barabbas, release to us Barabbas. This is the most shameful moment in the human history. It's the most shameful thing we've ever done. We literally here chose evil over Christ. It's what we did. 
A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. What's motivating that? But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent. There's that word again. They're being driven by passion. Demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their what? Will. Here's what I want you to think about. Especially as we now step into the final phase of this earth's history. I'm convinced beyond all shadow of a doubt that we're there. How do all these people make all these bad decisions? How could they be so incredibly misguided? How do you get to that point? It's an important question because here in the modern West, we have a tendency right now to worship the concept of democracy. Somehow, everybody out there believes that the will of the majority is going to fix what's wrong with this world, that you put it to a vote and the will of the majority is going to fix everything. But let me assure you, democracy is not a biblical concept. It is an entirely Greek and pagan concept. That's where it was born. Why? Because, folks, the will of the majority is almost always going to be wrong in a fallen world. That's why you never, ever find God putting moral questions to a vote in the pages of the Bible. Because if everybody is fallen, then they're all going to come to the wrong decision. The vote will be wrong. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong to use democratic means. I, I don't mean to put anybody in trouble, because if you go to the GC session, they got their little voting machines, and they use democratic means to make decisions. There's nothing particularly wrong with that. But out there in the world, they think they're going to find moral truth by putting it to a vote, and we're in for a rude awakening if we think that's going to fix the world. I mean, just let's think about it biblically for a moment. At some point in Israel's history, absolutely almost everybody thought that worshiping Moloch and sacrificing your firstborn children was a really good idea. Put it to a vote that day, they're voting for Moloch. Same thing happened with the golden calf. The vast majority wanted to worship the calf. The devil puts the idea of eating the fruit in the Garden of Eden. And how many in favor of eating the forbidden fruit? All right, Adam, Eve, you're both in. Majority says that eating the fruit is just fine. And on the day when we shamefully drag God's son in front of a pagan Roman governor to be judged, we all voted to put him to death. The will of the majority is going to go in the wrong direction. That's why I'm a little worried when I hear so much emphasis right now on protecting and preserving and promoting democracy. Be careful with it. There's a reason the founders of the American Republic did not make this a democracy. They understood democracy has a horrible, horrible track record. Democracy never lasts more than 200 years, historically speaking. Never more than about three, four generations, and it starts to fall apart. Why? Because the moment the people realize they can vote stuff for themselves, it begins to collapse. We'll get more money. We'll have more freedoms. We'll have no more restrictions. They vote themselves all kinds of things, and then the system starts to implode. And when it implodes, people panic, and when they panic, they start to vote away everybody's freedoms. It's what happens over and over and over again. The founders of the American Republic, because this republic was born on top of the Protestant Reformation, they understood this, so they made it a republic and not a democracy. That way, it is much harder to take away your liberties. It makes it super hard to ban your religion. They're going to do it. It is coming, and it's coming fast. But it's harder because of the way this place was structured. And I believe God had a hand in it. There's a reason Ellen White calls the American Constitution a Protestant and Republican document. She said it was built out of the Reformation and this nation needed to be born because it was the only place on earth that this movement could start. This is it. The remnant church couldn't have begun anywhere else on the planet. God arranged it here. So, now, back to the story of Pilate. How do these people make such a horrible decision? How do they think they're right? The majority thinks Jesus should be put to death. And don't forget, these are the covenant people of God, and they're voting to murder Christ. How is that possible? To find the answer, we go back to the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And we're going to look at the first time the entire human race made the wrong decision. But just before we do that, we're going to have a little bit of fun this morning. I'm going to ask you four theoretical questions. 
These are moral dilemmas, and I'm not interested in how they should be solved. I want you to pay attention to how you analyze them. Just think about the thoughts that pop into your head as you consider each of them. And I stole these. I stole these from a rabbi that I'd been reading who's a brilliant commentator on Genesis, and he puts these four moral dilemmas out there. Here comes number one. Again, I'm not looking for the answer. Is it okay to disconnect a dying man from life support? All right, I don't, it's not a yes or no question. I want you to think about what you're thinking now. We start to analyze it. Are we sure that he's dying? How much pain is he in? Are there other people who would stand a better chance if they got access to the equipment? Think about how you're analyzing the question. I don't care about yes or no, just how are we analyzing it? Number two, your frail elderly mother, she's 98. She sold her house. She's going to the home. She needs your help Sunday night to clean it because she's got to be out Monday morning. But your child also needs help studying for final exam that is 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday. And you don't have any help. Just let roll with this question. You have to choose between mom and your child. How are you going to spend your Sunday night? Which one are you going to pick? Question number three. Imagine you're in the third grade. You're eight years old. And you saw your friend Billy with a crib sheet. He cheated on the spelling test, and you know it for sure. You saw him do it. And the teacher comes along because the teacher didn't watch Billy and says, did Billy cheat on the exam? Do you know anything? Do you tell the truth? You're eight years old. Or do you save your friend? Now, in reality, Billy cheated. He deserves to be thrown under the bus. Amen? He should get caught. But you struggle with it anyway, don't you? There's just a moment of hesitation. The last one. It's a dark and rainy night at a usual October in Portland, Oregon. And you're leaving here this evening and you accidentally back into a car and you leave a big old dent in the door. And you get out and you realize nobody saw you. And there's no cameras on the hotel. Nobody saw you do it at all. You know you're going to get away with it. There's no chance you're ever going to get caught. You could drive away and never ever get caught. Do you leave a note or do you drive away? Which one do you do? Now, that's all four questions. Here's what I want you to think about. Were those questions all the same? Did you analyze all of them the same way? When you start to think about it, how are they the same or different? One of them is different. The first three force you to compete with different values. You're pitting different values against each other. You're making a good decision or a decision between good things. With the man on life support, you're kind of choosing between ending his suffering or preserving his life or, or, or saving someone else who needs the equipment. You're weighing different good things. The same with cleaning up your mom's house. Helping your mom is good. Helping your child is good. You have to pick one. You're, you're wrestling between two good things. Even with Billy and the spelling test, even though Billy is a cheat and Billy should get caught, you still hesitate for a moment because you're wrestling with honesty versus loyalty to your friends. We analyze a lot of things by trying to pick the best of our options. But the fourth one was a little bit different, wasn't it? When you back into somebody's car and drive away, are you pitting good values against each other or are you saving your skin? The first three require you to use reason. The fourth one appeals to your basic instincts and passion. It's different. And this is where the story of Genesis becomes really, really important, especially right now when our decision, our ability to make good decisions appears to be disintegrating all around us and we appear to be headed into a massive, massive moral crisis before Christ comes. And I can assure you, the world's going to come up with a solution for that crisis, but you're not going to like it. And all the world wandered after the beast. Let me show you something fascinating. Let's go into the book of Genesis. This is fascinating. And out of the ground, the Lord God made spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we have the story of the garden and the two trees. It continues. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Notice we always had something to do. It's not slavery like the Babylonian story. It was constructive, God-honoring work, the kind of work that becomes worship. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Every Adventist knows this story. It's foundational. But I want you to pay attention to what happens now in the very next verse. Because if you read it like you're reading it for the first time, the next part of the story is really very strange. It's very strange. 
Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now that's the truth, amen? How many men should really be left unsupervised all the time? Not very many. It is not good. There's a reason we die younger. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Think about this. The story starts in Genesis 2. God establishes a garden. Here's the tree of life. Here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and it makes a lot of sense. But then suddenly, for some strange reason, it suddenly pivots away from the two trees in the garden. And it talks about Adam finding a mate. And it's a very strange story when you start to read it. Because where does God take Adam first? He starts to show him the animals. And as we're reading it, we know full well reading the story, he's not going to find a mate among the animals. It's not like he's going to see a hippo and think, there she is, girl of my dreams. I mean, there's, it's not going to be a chicken or a banana. We know he's not going to find something. So why put that story in there? Why? What's the point of it? What's the point? The Bible says, for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Well, no kidding, Moses. None of us expected him to find one. It's a very strange story. And we're not surprised either when he sees Eve and he really likes what he sees. Wow, there we go, Lord. That's it. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one's like me. Why the animal story? Why is it in there? You find the answer in Genesis chapter 3. Look at this. The very next thing that happens. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? What is a snake? It's an animal. What just happened? Adam saw all the animals. And he said, I'm not like them. He studies them. Eve is like me, not the animals. Why didn't the devil come as a brilliant angel? That would have been very impressive, right? He's very beautiful, very imposing. Why does he show up as an animal? It's because God just finished showing Adam all the animals, and Adam came to the conclusion, we are not animals. Human beings are different. We really are. We've always known that, but we struggle to explain why we're different than the animals. Listen to the biologists and the zoologists for the last 200 years. Try to explain the difference. We know there's a difference, but nobody knows what it is. It seems obvious to Christians what it is, but not to everybody else. What makes us different? For a long time, we said it's intelligence that makes us different. People are more intelligent than animals. We have a brain about the size of your two fists put together. This is not a good day to have tiny hands. And so there we go. That's the human brain, and your cat has a brain about the size of your thumbnail. See, we're different from the animals because we're more intelligent. But then we started to study it, and we realized, you know, pigs and dolphins have pretty big brains, and they're pretty bright, so it can't be just intelligence that sets us apart. Somebody else said about 200 years ago, it's language. Human beings have language. Now we know that's not entirely true either because chimps can develop a vocabulary of about 200 words, about the vocabulary of a two-year-old, sign language. We know that they can learn those words. We know that dogs learn commands. And we know this, that the dolphins, all those chirps and whistles that they make, those chirps and whistles mean something. It's an actual language. And you know what we discovered about two years ago? Mommy dolphins dumb down their chirps and whistles for their babies. They use baby talk. That's what we've discovered. Mommy dolphins use baby talk. It's not language. What is it? When I was a kid, I asked that question. I wasn't raised Adventist. I asked, what's the difference between us and animals? And somebody told me, human beings have a soul, and they float off to heaven when they die, and animals just decompose. They don't have a soul. Well, I know now, growing up and reading my Bible, that's not true. Ecclesiastes says, for what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast with regard to death. For all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. That's not it then. What is it? The Bible says we were made in the image of God. It doesn't say that about the animals. And then God takes Adam and says, study these animals. What do you notice? Lord, they're not like me. I'm not like them. That's right. What's the difference? It's in the way we were designed to function in this world. Here's what it says in Patriarchs and Prophets. The harmony of creation depends upon the perfect conformity of all beings, of everything animate and inanimate to the law of the Creator. God has ordained laws for the government, not only of living beings, for the operations of nature. The world's an organized place. That's why creative geniuses like Newton or da Vinci made so much progress. They knew there was a creator, and if there's a creator, then creation should be orderly. And if creation is orderly, you can study it. And if you can study it, you can learn more about God. That's why science was successful in the beginning. It's Romans chapter 1. 
You can find God through the things that he has made. And once upon a time here in the West, universities were organized around this principle. You had a university and they had different colleges, right? You had a college of mathematics and a college of philosophy and a college of biology and a college of geology and so on. And all the discoveries in all those colleges were supposed to feed what they called the queen of sciences, which was theology, the search for God. In later years, since Karl Marx and Darwin, we changed it to philosophy. But in the beginning, we said universities are designed to help us learn about God. And then we changed that. And we began to tell ourselves we can study the universe without any help from God, take him out of the picture, and we can study and learn. Thomas Aquinas first planted that thought in the West, saying, you don't need God. Unaided reason can teach you everything you need to know. He believed in God, but he said, just use your reason. So we adopted that principle in the West, and now we've come to a point where philosophy hit a dead end in the 20th century and nobody has answers anymore. We've become painfully aware of how inadequate our brains are to figure anything out. Our, our, our perception of the world is twisted by our selfish orientation. Everything we see is bent on the way into our brain. And now we have no external source to check our findings against to find out if we're right. We even know now that when you recall memories, you rewrite them. You can't even trust your memories. Every time you bring up an incident from your childhood, you're rewriting it a little bit. You ever written down a story from your childhood and looked at it again 20 years later? You've grown it in the last 20 years because your brain rewrites it just a little bit. And we've come to the point where your secular neighbors don't know that they can believe anything for sure at all anymore. They don't know. What, what do we, they've untethered themselves from God, took them out of it. Now they're left with just a mechanical universe. That's all they have now. There's no immovable, universal, unchangeable, anything behind it. And now we don't know if we know anything for sure. And the worst part is, we have no idea if human beings mean anything. We're just here. That's the biggest problem your neighbors are wrestling with. Back to Ellen White, what makes us different? While everything in nature is governed by natural laws, man alone of all that inhabits the earth is amenable to moral law. That's the difference. To man, the crowning work of creation, God has given power to understand his requirements. That's the difference between human beings and animals. Animals live by instinct, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way they were designed, to live by their passions. You see a mountain lion jump on a deer and kill it, you don't accuse it of murder. You think the deer was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the lion was just hungry. You don't accuse it of breaking God's law. You find a guy in a tent and the wolves have eaten him. You don't accuse the wolves of getting together and plotting murder, do you? You just think that camper shouldn't have been there at the right time. Like Timothy Treadwell up in Alaska. The grizzly bears came through the tent when the fish ran dry that year. So they ate him. And you know nobody accused the grizzlies of murder? Nobody. But if you find Jeffrey Dahmer in a tent eating a guy, you accuse him of murder. Why? He's a human being. It's different. We're capable of living by God's moral law. We have the capacity to think and to reason and to contemplate long-term consequences, and we have the ability by living by God's moral law to understand him. Let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me, God says to Jeremiah. We have the capacity for an intelligent relationship with the God who reveals himself with logical propositions. Amen. We can contemplate them. Now let's look at the whole picture. In the story of the Garden of Eden, God puts two trees in the garden. Don't eat from this one or you will die. God then pivots and shows Adam, you are not like the animals, and he provides his perfect mate, Eve. She's like me. The next thing that happens, the devil appears as an animal, and he appeals to our passion instead of our reason. God just taught Adam you're not an animal. Now the devil shows up in chapter 3 and says, are you so sure about that? Are you sure you're not an animal? You know, according to one Jewish commentator that I really respect, he said, if you read the devil's questions in the original Hebrew, they're a little bit different than they read in English. A better, more literal translation, he said, would read, even if God said, do not eat from any of the trees of the garden, dot, dot, dot. In Hebrew, it never finishes the sentence. It just leaves it hanging there. What's the point of that? The devil comes along and says, are you so sure you're not an animal? Is living by God's word the only way to live? I mean, God made the animals too, didn't he? And they live by passion and by instinct, and they'd just be eating the fruit. Maybe you could do the same. Didn't God create your passions as well? This is the heart of the problem that we're facing right now, right, right here on this front. Watch what happens next. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was delight to the eyes. 
Is this reason or instinct? And that the tree was to be desired, reason or instinct. This is describing the moment that our human race made passion take the front seat instead of reason. We were made with the capacity to understand God through His moral requirements. That's what makes us different from the animals. Animals live by instinct. Nothing wrong with that. But you and I were expected to conquer our passions and live by God's Word first. That's why the devil shows up looking like an animal. And he says in the very beginning in the original Hebrew, okay, God said don't eat it. That's true. But so what? God created your passions too, didn't He? Now the 21st century makes incredible sense. Suddenly you can see why we're living in a world that abandoned all moral reason and lives by passion. If you feel it, that must be the truth. If you feel it, that must be who you are. I know the Bible says we're created male and female. That's what God said. But what do you think you are? What do your feelings tell you? The Bible says you need to confess and repent of your sins. But don't worry about that. Don't worry about any of those requirements. What does your heart tell you to do? Follow your heart. Look, logically, there can't be more than one truth. We know Aristotle said A cannot be non-A. But put that aside for a minute. What do your feelings tell you your truth is? Passion. It's not the way we were made. I mean, we were made with passions. I praise the Lord for that, right? If we didn't have any passions, we would never eat and we would never have children. I mean, that's just the way it works. And I'm glad. I enjoyed the passion of pursuing my wife. Oh, my goodness, I enjoyed it. It's a gift from God. But we're expected to live by God's word first. Pontius Pilate. Reason said Jesus is innocent. The word of God comes to him through his wife. He's innocent. Don't touch him. Reason says don't do it. Passion tells a different story. He caves to the passion of the crowd. He caves to his own passions to save his own skin. And because it's more comfortable to follow passion than to do what's reasonable that day, he turned Jesus over to die. And I look at that story and I say, that shouldn't have happened. But then I wonder how often have my passions re-crucified Jesus? How often have I done it? The book of Hebrews says every time we cave in, we crucify the Son of God afresh. Is there a reason that Revelation taps mostly into Daniel 7 instead of the other chapters? Is there a reason God shows us all the kingdoms of this world as animals? Lion, bear, leopard. These are the fallen kingdoms of the world that are driven by selfish passion instead of the Word of God. And in Revelation 13, we get the final manifestation of it. This is the ultimate expression of human desire disconnected from God. The beast power of Revelation 13 is the final expression of our choice to live like animals. Even our best efforts, like the lamb-like beast, end in failure. And the only solution? Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. The Bible says God had to become one of us. And he didn't just die for us, he lived for us too. Never traded his obedience for passion, not even once. He pushed away the passion of hunger. He pushed away the passion of loneliness. He pushed away the mockery. He always did the will of God. At the end of his ministry, he could say, I have kept your commandments, Father. His life saves us too. He felt passion. He felt the weight of our sins crushing him. In Gethsemane, if it be possible, let it pass from me. But then reason. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And so he dies the death that is ours so that we can have the life that is as Jesus saves us as the Son of Man. This is why it's so important to be back in this book right now and not just read it, live it. Because that's how you truly understand it. This is where we need to be anchored. This tells us whether our passions are on track or not. The world's losing its mind. That much is obvious. There are no moral anchors out there anymore. But if we don't live this book, we won't have any either. Not when the crisis hits. For a long time, folks, I followed my instincts, and I've got the scars to prove it. Don't cave in, kids, young people. I got the scars. I knew what the Word of God said. I was raised on it. But I was a fool. I figured passions must be right. If I felt like doing it, I did it. If life's too hard, go drinking with your friends. Running out of food money, go rob the lunch truck. Can't 
get the energy to study, cheat on the exam. If I wanted something, I took it. I did whatever my passions told me to do. I had to learn the hard way that this book is right. It's never been wrong. Some of you sitting here have done the same thing. You followed your passions, even though you knew it wasn't what God said. And when the bill came due, and it always does, you couldn't pay it. So Jesus does. Your neighbor can't pay their bill either. That's why the only thing that matters anymore is finishing the work. Amen. They don't have what we have. They don't even understand what's going on, and we have that privilege too. Nobody can pay their bill. So Jesus does. There's a cost to following him, though. There's a bill there too. You look at him hanging on that cross with that crown of thorns that we shoved on his scalp through our evil passions. He prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's right. We abandon all reason. We're living by passion. And he says, pick up your cross. Follow me now. There's a price for that. Surprisingly small. We tried to call up our greatest trials, but they look so small compared with the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that surrounded us that we could not speak them out, and we all cried out, Hallelujah. Heaven is cheap enough. That's ours. Not because we deserve it. Not because we feel like we deserve it. But because God says so. How are you going to spend the days we have left here? There's only one thing that matters anymore. And it's not us. <laughs>